Your Excellency Dr. Mohammad Ashraf Ghani, President of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji, Excellencies and distinguished guests. By our proverb, may Kabul be without gold, but not without snow. With Shatut Camp, Dam, Kabul's snow and rain will be harnessed to quench the thirst of around 2 million citizens. Jo nadi tum mein behti hai, wo mujh mein bhi behti hai. You're watching Strat News Global. I'm Amit Abrevi. Joining us from Berlin is yeah. India's former envoy to Afghanistan, Amar Sina, to talk about uh, developments that straddled both Kabul and Delhi. Ambassador, thanks so much for your time. I do know you're taking some time off, but uh, glad to see you on Strat News again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Uh, and a uh, um, warm welcome to all our viewers. In fact, uh, good evening to Akang Meren, who also wishes uh, us a, a good evening. You can put in your questions or comments that you like. Ambassador, the virtual conference today between Prime Minister Modi and uh, President Ghani, you heard the words there from both. Uh, the Shatu Dam itself, explain to us, I mean, uh, you've been involved in it in terms of the run-up or the talk that has been on since, I think, 2016. Why is it so important for Kabul? Well, uh, uh, first, I think, uh, well, congratulations both to government of India and government of Afghanistan that they actually finally signed an MOU on a very critical uh, dam. You see, it's important not only because it actually services the growing city of Kabul, which uh, counts well a number of what, 2 million people, but I think there are estimates that there could, perhaps there are 3 million people living in Kabul, and it was really water stressed. The other important factor there is, you know, that finally uh, Afghanistan has started using its own resources, you know, which were going waste. Uh, of course, the friendship dam that PM mentioned in Salma, uh, in, in, um, in Herat, which was started in 2016. And then this year, Afghan government has also completed two other dams. You know, one is the Shorabag Dam, I think, in Faizabad, and the other one is uh, Kamal Khan Dam in Nimruz. Plus, they are working on Kazaki Dam in Helmand. So, obviously, there's a very concerted effort to use all the resources. And, of course, water is perhaps the easiest resource, which uh, if you don't use, it just goes waste. It goes uh, down the drain, literally. So, to both service Kabul, and I think it's a great requirement. So, uh, I'm really very happy that uh, government has decided to go ahead with this. Uh, in fact, if you know, it was announced in 2016, 2017. Yeah. When a project like this... Uh, takes time, you know, there was some sort of World Bank was also involved in terms of the feasibility, etc. But now that has been done. And the good news is that the course had uh, some time ago, even before uh, 2001, done a full audit of the water resources of Afghanistan. And I think they have listed out nearly 24 sites where similar dams could be done. So it's a good first step. Let them start using uh, the water and then perhaps the resources which are under the ground uh, could be tapped in. Afghan President Ashraf Ghani uh, was both rhetorical and realistic in his virtual address when he was speaking. He talked about the gift of uh, water, but he also had a very serious message both internally for Afghanistan, the region and the world when it came to the crossroads that Afghanistan finds itself again in. No, absolutely. Uh, both I heard both of them very intently. Uh, President Ghani, of course, is very good with words. Uh, he's yeah. absolutely excellent in terms of the imageries he brings in, the uh, Toynbee that he quotes. But I think our Prime Minister's speech, I think, was very mm -hmm. significant, if you notice that. Uh, it was a very clear-cut uh, enunciation of India's position. Uh, a great reassurance to the Afghan people and Afghan nation. Must that serve India as lessons to us will uh, stand behind them uh, and i think that is a very reassuring message plus prime minister also talked about immediate ceasefire uh, when the peace has uh, process has to move forward he talked about that no foreign country uh, mind you uh, will be able to affect our relationship mm. or 
even so basically the underlying message was that afghanistan is not available for anyone who wants to just take it over militarily or through military means and i think that no. message of solidarity uh, i think was very critical today let's just uh, listen into what uh, president or uh, an excerpt prof or what president ashraf ghani uh, first said in the virtual conference yes is the central desire of the afghan people and there's a consensus both nationally and within the state to seek peace but that peace must be a peace that ends violence not becomes a preface in a chapter to another tragedy the tragedies of the past must serve as lessons to us so we do not repeat history in in there lies the role of indian diplomacy i would like to thank uh, uh foreign minister jay shankar and foreign minister atmar for their very close co collaboration because this is the moment where regional consensus and international consensus on the need for guarantees for a stable and prosperous afghanistan <clears throat> are essential we must ask the world to ask all stakeholders to respect the rules of sovereignty in international relations stop giving sanctuaries and stop interfering in the affairs of their neighbors the pearl mr prime minister lies in misunderstanding this this moment peace in afghanistan is within grasp if parties and their backers in the taliban embrace a true political solution but afghans will not submit to surrender and it must be understood that our heroic security forces are not defeated and neither if we lost our will or capacity for serving our people should god forbid afghanistan be plunged into uncertainty the consequences for the region and the world will be dire an extreme uh, stern warning there about the dire situation if it gets out of control and also uh, a message to both the taliban and the pakistan ambassador sinha oh yes absolutely no and he also talked about uh, global consensus in fact uh, yeah. over the last one and a half years when you know this negotiation with us uh, taliban was happening the narrative seemed to have taken hold that as if uh, taliban at any cost has to be brought to kabul and i don't think that is if you really read all the documents not only the agreement but statements that us has uh, issued with say russia or russia yeah. china us uh, statement or the special representatives of eu uh, us un germany france uk have issued few things on which there is absolute consensus one that there will be no going back to emirate that nobody is going to accept an emirate and i think this message needs to go out very clearly to taliban and the backers of taliban who are really living in some sort of a uku land that they can put back the clock to 1996 that is not going to happen and i think president khani has said it very well uh second consensus is uh, that the the role of the us troops and the international forces should be responsible the only break i have seen is the recent statement by uh, the pakistani foreign minister who obviously when the biden government came uh, i i guess he displayed a certain amount of anxiety uh, that he didn't want a review to mean that it may be slowed down they felt that maybe their objectives are so close they need to grab it immediately so he was the only one who has said that america should stick to the withdrawal schedule given in the agreement nobody else has uh, said that and this is of course i find that this is a change because till 5 months ago if you look at pakistani statements they are also this talk about responsible uh, withdrawal uh, the gains of the past uh, 20 mm. years i think there's a consensus it should not uh, be sort of watered down or uh, erased uh, plus that there will be no military solution so there is a lot of consensus which basically supports uh, what president khani is saying 
uh, and uh, I think the critical statement the Prime Minister made was, you know, besides the stability, it needs the political unity in Afghanistan is absolutely critical, so that they, the negotiations happen between uh, uh, a state which is united uh, and which is trying to reconcile an insurgent group which is based outside in Pakistan. In fact, uh, let's just uh, play out what you're talking about uh, in terms of the Prime Minister, an excerpt uh, from his speech uh, during that virtual conference. रही हिंसा से हम चिंतित हैं निर्दोष नागरिकों पत्रकारों और कार्यकर्ताओं को कायरतापूर्ण ढंग से निशाना बनाया जा रहा है हमने हिंसा को तत्काल समाप्त करने का आह्वान किया है और हम फौरन एक व्यापक संघर्ष विराम का समर्थन करते हैं हिंसा शांति का प्रतिकार है और दोनों साथ-साथ नहीं चल सकते एक निकट पड़ोसी और मजबूत स्ट्रेटजिक पार्टनर के रूप में भारत और अफगानिस्तान दोनों ही अपने क्षेत्र को आतंकवाद और उग्रवाद से और ऐसे भयंकर संकट से मुक्त देखना चाहते हैं भारत एक ऐसी शांति प्रक्रिया का समर्थन करता रहा है जो अफगानिस्तान के नेतृत्व में हो अफगानिस्तान के स्वामित्व में हो और अफगानिस्तान के नियंत्रण में हो अफगानिस्तान के आवाम में अंदरूनी एक जुटा एक जुटता को मजबूत करना बहुत जरूरी है। अब योर डी प्राइम मिनिस्टर दे जस्ट टेकिंग अ क्वेश्चन एम्बेसर फ्रॉम शिवा टाइसन डायरेक्टेड टू टू यू व्हाट इज़ योर व्यू ऑन इंडिया इन्वेस्टिंग सो हेवली इन अफगानिस्तान इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर बट स्टिल पाकिस्तान हैज एन अप with the high likelihood of uh, uh, another angle that the RNW has backdoor consultation. Just the one before this, uh, if I can ask my producer to play, the uh, Shiva Tyson uh, had a question for the ambassador. Yeah. Go ahead, ambassador. Well, I think, you see, uh, whether whatever be the nature of future government of Afghanistan, the fact that Afghanistan will remain our neighbor and the fact that it needs development and reconstruction, it is, uh, it cannot be overlooked. Uh, even if you look at the statements of Taliban leadership, they have actually appealed uh, to the international community that they welcome development partnership. Obviously, this development partnership will come with certain conditionalities. It cannot be a blank check to Taliban that they uh, create an emirate and, and treat uh, people the way they did in 1996 and do this. And this thing on Pakistan having an upper hand, I don't think that is uh, true, really. Uh, if uh, if you had just took a, a, a survey in Afghanistan, you will realize that Pakistan's standing is fairly, very low. Uh, of course, Pakistan is an immediate neighbor. It should and it could have an important role, provided their policies are right. Unfortunately, their policies uh, are precisely what they are trying to do uh, with India, that where they keep pushing that terrorism and talks can go together. That is what they're trying to sell to Afghans. Uh, then they want a weak Kabul, and that is why they're pushing for an interim government as quickly as possible so that their sort of proteges get back uh, into some sort of a power structure in Kabul formally. Uh, but uh, actually, it has been a stalemate on the military ground, on the military front. Uh, one can say that that is uh, ascendancy of Taliban. The ascendancy of Taliban was not militarily. Actually, it was more diplomatic. And it was all created uh, because of this U.S.-Taliban negotiations. You see, and it is ironical that there are, see, even on 28th of 29th of February, if you look, there were at least four or five different documents that have been issued around that uh, Doha talks. Uh, where Afghan, uh, U.S. with its own partners, with Russia and, and U.S. Afghan government has issued documents. However, everybody seems to be focused on a document which is with Taliban, which uh, U.S. itself says that it is signing with Emirate, which it does not recognize. So I don't know why we give it so much privacy. Of course, as Mr. Ghani said, this is 
they have created an opportunity for peace. But then peace will only come if there is an intention of peace on both sides. Uh, and actually facts on the ground, as pointed out by Prime Minister, uh, there's, uh, I don't have much hope that if Taliban continues the way it is, I don't think they are looking for peace. They are looking for power. Um, and I think we should not be overtly uh, worried about ultimately India's uh, partnership with Afghanistan affects people. And Taliban also, uh, while we built the dams and electricity uh, lines, yeah. none of those uh, infrastructure were attacked or our people harassed. And I'm sure because they know what is good for their, their country, eventually they will come back one day uh, in some form or the other. We're just looking at uh, India's overall uh, aid package to uh, Afghanistan and the various projects, some of them which you've been closely associated with. Um, I'm also going to take in another question uh, for you from GS, who says, uh, with the high likelihood of the Taliban returning to power in Afghanistan, how is India hedging the risk from the Taliban slash Pakistan proxies to this dam and other infrastructure projects undertaken till date? You ki kind of uh, alluded to the fact that the uh, that the Taliban weren't attacking these infrastructure projects. No, no not at all. I, I don't think they have been very careful in, in not destroying their own country. Uh, and I don't think we should, uh, we are at a position where we are looking at Taliban coming back to power. Yes, they are coming back into the power structure as some sort of a political settlement where they will have a share of the power. But I don't think they are going to have a monopoly of the power because, as I said, uh, I don't think that is acceptable to the international community. And any government uh, to have viable governance would require assistance, would require first the recognition of the international community. And I think India's recognition uh, in South Asia uh, will be a starting point uh, unless Taliban wants to have recognition of just three countries. Today, you, they may not even get three. They may just get Pakistan. Now, does that become an effective government? I don't think so. So, uh, but, but things have changed a lot. I mean, uh, from those three, you're referring to Pakistan, UAE and Saudi Arabia. Now the Taliban are in uh, capitals of all across the world, Russia, Iran, Uzbekistan, Indonesia. Yes, uh, yes Amitabh. Uh, that, you see, we'll have to make a distinction. Uh, my view is slightly different on this. Yeah. that receiving delegations in different capitals with an aim to encourage them to uh, start peace negotiations and come to the table is very different from recognizing a government run by Taliban. You know, these are two different things because that will be defining the nature of the state itself. Right now, they are being, of course, they have been encouraged uh, and, and I've seen that, but... Uh, uh, don't forget that they still, many of them remain under UN sanctions. Uh, we are on the UN sanctions uh, committee, we are the chair. Uh, so it is, I don't think anybody has given Taliban a free pass to do whatever they can and get away with it. And you can see the voices today from NATO, from, a, uh, from US, new. Uh, the new Biden administration, that they are all pointing to the fact that the agreement, any agreement has two mm -hmm. parties. And both parties have obligations and commitments. So they will have to really see. And right when the agreement was signed, it was always said that every part of this agreement is interconnected. Uh, so it's not that they, you can have progress only on one track, while Taliban does nothing except uh, try to spend time waiting. Uh, they're making the Afghan negotiators wait while they're traveling in the region. Uh, so obviously, they are waiting for a signal from uh, the U.S. government that they would continue and they will that this uh, 29th February agreement is sacrosanct. Uh, and obviously, I personally feel the Taliban will not like much changes. So I don't know what uh, we are looking at. So uh, ultimately, they will have to be resisted. And from, from India's perspective, at every cost, it has to be resisted because it sends a signal that actually a policy which supports terrorism uses uh, religion or their interpretation of religion to gain power is not acceptable in our religion. And, and I think that should be our policy. You're referring, of course, to the Biden administration sending out a clear signal when it's saying it's, it's uh, reviewing the Doha deal. Just taking a related question from Tanuj Abe Khanna, who says he's talking about Ambassador um, Khalil Zad's continuation and asking whether it's a negative the violence hasn't receded from the Taliban side. Will Biden return to Pakistan appeasing policy with regards to Afghanistan? It's the same team at play, mostly uh, 
uh, in terms of uh, Khalidat for now is still the special representative. And some of uh, the players, including then Vice President Biden, and with Pakistan Ambassador. Well, let's put it this way that uh, Ambassador Khalilzad continuing is a mixed bag. You can look at it both ways uh, as a positive. I personally have actually publicly supported that he should continue. He should continue for simple reason because that new government uh, needs to be briefed on every written and unwritten uh, agreement and commitments that were exchanged in, in the 18 months of negotiations which produced the document. And that knowledge is with Mr. Khalilzad. So I think that continuity was absolutely important. The negative, you could say that, well, then what would the review mean? Obviously, you don't expect a person who has been the author of a document to go and rewrite it completely. You know, at best, they can tweak. Uh, and even the, um, the Congressional Study Group, which has come up with a suggestion yeah. that uh, US government uh, seek time. Uh, what I found a bit astonishing was the wording used that the U.S. government seek time from Taliban uh, as if they are not equal parties, but they are sort of beseeching Taliban, please give us six more months. So I have a feeling that Taliban would continue with this policy of absolutely doing nothing, continuing with violence, uh, uh, choosing soft targets, which of course will be claimed by other groups so that Taliban is not blamed but uh, it saps the will of the Afghan government and Afghan people. Right. You were an unofficial representative of India at the Moscow format uh, talks, but uh, since then, uh, India has the foreign minister addressed that February 29th meeting in Doha virtually. We had uh, a senior um, diplomat uh, who's a great Kabul hand, uh, ex Kabul hand, GS Pai, now. Um, J.B. Singh also there in Doha. Uh, we don't know if there's anything going on behind the scenes, but uh, a lot of questioning on how should India deal with the Taliban. I spoke earlier to uh, Dr. Avinash Palwal, who's a professor of international relations at uh, SOAS in uh, London, who's also an author of My Enemy's Enemy. This is yes. what he had to say about uh, the Taliban and India. Today, as it could, would have in 2011, 2013, 2012, it cannot afford to be seen as talking to India. Now, this is a compulsion that any Taliban leader, whether a military shura, political shura, uh, you know, sitting in Quetta, sitting in Doha, any Taliban official you talk to, they will very clearly say that, look, if we start talking to the Indians openly, then we'll have a lot of questions and a lot of questions. Uh, with with the ISI, with Pakistan. And I think that is a compulsion that they have not really been able to liberate themselves out of. So as far as I'm concerned, I would see Taliban openly talking to India as the ultimate litmus test of their foreign policy independence uh, uh, in Afghanistan. The day a Taliban representative, the day Mullah Baradar comes and says, officially, we want to talk to India, and we want to respect and we become kind of, you know, be open to respecting India's red lines in Afghanistan, its sensitivities, its interests. That is the day I would say, yes, this is a movement which has matured out of the kind of uh, influence that it has it has been under of, of the of the Pakistani security establishment. And that is one reason, that's one thing which I don't foresee happening, at least in the short I spoken to Professor Palival uh, just after our uh, NSA. Ajit Doval uh, traveled to uh, Kabul in mid-January. There's been a lot of talk of, uh, a lot of analysis of what India should be doing vis-a-vis -vis the Taliban. Ambassador, your, your position or your views? Um, actually, I would agree with uh, what Professor Paliwal says in terms of uh, independence. You see, we have to accept the Taliban or the members of Taliban are Afghans. And eventually, if they wish to come back to the society, reintegrate peacefully, uh, India will deal with them like it deals with every Afghan uh, citizen and every Afghan political faction. But exactly the determination, the litmus test is whether it still remains as a proxy of Pakistan or it is an independent nationalist force. As long as there are sanctuaries and safe havens and training camps, uh, and areas for rest and recuperation remain in Pakistan, I think their dependence is very, very high on Pakistan. 
And that clear signal, both to the US government and the incoming administration, was when Mr. Baradar visited in December. Uh, he went yeah. to Pakistan and he also leaked clips of his visiting yeah. uh, frontline soldiers. So, what yeah. exactly was that? I think they were uh, sending a message that they're willing to fight and they're preparing to fight uh, if the deal doesn't go through as they want it uh, or on their terms. So yes, it is at one level a complete proxy of Pakistan, and that is what Pakistan wants. Uh, now, how much independence they will get once they get in? Because I don't think Pakistan puts all its eggs in one basket. If you just have to go back to the history of how Mujahideens were split into seven groups, uh, how one group was played against the other, how Hekmatyar was kept till uh, two years ago. Uh, and today, I think the, the force of choice is Haqqani Network. Which is also, if you uh, look at the reports, is the new coordinator between the Taliban, AQ, and ISPK. So obviously, the new game uh, is is already being played. And somebody in Kabul had told me that Taliban leaders who actually are offered in peace are only uh, the two Afghanistan are the ones who become expendable. Let's put it this way. Hmm. Uh, related uh, questions I'm taking from Hemant Juneja, who says it's been reported. I think he's uh, referring to First Vice President Amarullah Saleh saying that 85% uh, of the Taliban are back fighting the government. They go back on their word. So how does one trust the Taliban? Peace, how is uh, the question he's raising. Another uh, document, no, no, no. We're talking about documents and unwritten documents that uh, maybe Khalid Zad could, uh, would be sharing, of course, with the Biden administration now is document that came out in Kabul, which has been the talk of the town over the last week, which suggested that the Taliban and the U.S., unverified document, uh, were working towards an interim government. I spoke to um, Afghanistan's charge uh, d'affaires in India, Tahir Kadri, outgoing charge d'affaires. I think he'll take up his next assignment soon on uh, what uh, the administration, the government uh, thinks about this talk of an interim uh, administration. And now there have already been interviews that they have given in various countries mm -hmm. calling for an interim government saying that they do not recognize, especially the President Ghani-led government. Mm -hmm. Now that's a red line that is uh, President Ghani has made it clear he will not cross, right? Uh, well, I mean, Tabji, President Ghani was uh, elected by people in a democratic, you know, election. So what the Taliban are expecting is, you know, something which is not there. So we have got a constitution which actually everything is stipulated there. So people, it is people, we believe in people's voices that they go to the ballots and vote. And that's what they did. So that's why um, uh, that is not rational uh, at all. I mean, their demand. So we have got the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. We have got our elections where one person, one vote, and they decide like who should be the leader of Afghanistan, which we have the current government. So um, as a result, um, uh, we are trying to tell the Taliban that, you know, um, uh, there is this, this uh, uh, the democratic values that you can also be, come and be part of it. Like, you know, in the past as well, we have accommodated so many other groups as well that now, now they are doing yeah. political, you know, they have political ambitions and they are running, you know, their political ambitions. So why not them? I think they are exactly, there is platform for the Taliban to come and work under the uh, uh, the umbrella of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Is there under the uh, government of uh, President Ghani though? Because the Taliban have made it clear that uh, one, they don't want to work under him and uh, they or with him. And they're looking at an interim government uh, ambassador. Well, yes, that has been their uh, stance throughout. Uh, no, not only President Ghani, uh, he, they call them uh, puppet government, but even before President Karzai, they used to say exactly the same. See, their logic is very simple. Uh, they are telling Americans that, listen, when you came in here, we were in government. Uh, so you put us back in government uh, at the head of the government when you leave. You know, basically, leave Afghanistan as you found it. Now, unfortunately, uh, history doesn't uh, evolve like that. Obviously, things have happened. Uh, but but to even consider their uh, statements uh, sort of seriously uh, of calling somebody else a government which is elected by the people as puppet and proxy uh, is, I think, a bit too thick for me uh, because it itself is a proxy force. In fact, people need to ask them uh, some hard questions that who exactly is financing and funding their lifestyle in Doha. 
How come the entire leadership has been based in Pakistan for 20 years now? Perhaps they have not even seen Kabul uh, for years. And that is why they are even scared to come to Kabul for negotiations. Because then they know oh, that they're well, well, President Ghani even uh, invited them to Kandahar for negotiations, which is... Oh, absolutely. Uh, ultimately, there. that's where, uh, or maybe they would want to have hold it in Quetta, uh, <laughs> where their headquarters is, I don't know. Uh, but um, that's the India's position, you know, when there was uh, all the dispute about the elections and then we, we uh, Har Singla, foreign secretary, went there. There was a, a letter from the prime minister. India seemed to be siding with President Ghani. Is is, is that how you see it? Uh, no, I don't see it like that, really. I don't think we make choices in terms of who becomes the president or who doesn't become. As sure. you know, we have friends uh, throughout. But yes, it is definitely siding and, and a great support to the democratic system. And ultimately, yeah. what Prime Minister said is not something only a mantra that should be Afghan owned, Afghan controlled, and Afghan led. Uh, no, even the democratic process has to be Afghan owned and Afghan controlled. Uh, and it is for the people and the institutions uh, which uh, run the elections, it is for them. Uh, they have the judiciary, they have everybody. And I know in every election, somebody wins, somebody loses. Uh, perhaps your friends could lose also. But you have to support the system rather than individuals. And uh, we, we have our contacts with everybody across the political spectrum. There's a related question, Manvinder Singh, who says, we have previously dealt with Ahmed Shah Masood, referring to the Northern Alliance. So why is Abdullah Abdullah not our main man in Afghanistan? Uh, because Afghanistan is not uh, one personality-driven uh, country, yeah. let's put it this way. The fact is that it, there are many leaders you know, in every tribe, every uh, sort of area and geography, you have different uh, leadership. Uh, they have, there are historical reasons for this, but uh, that is the reality. Uh, so all of them are our friends. Uh, and in fact, talking of Ahmad Shah Masood, you know, when he fought the Soviets, I don't think he had contacts with India. Once he got back into Pakistan and they started looking at an independent Afghanistan, that is when he had reached out. So I have no doubt that even Taliban tomorrow, given the chance, uh, uh, you know, the stranglehold that Pakistanis have on them, uh, they would uh, be better inclined towards India and we will continue. And that is why our uh, focus on people uh, to people contact. And we should really worry about not the physical infrastructure. Uh, that doesn't go very much. It is the human assets, or the, what Prime Minister mentioned today, and the, the human resources that we have helped create there uh, are the ones who really need to be looked after and we have to worry about them. Uh, rest. Right. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Need to, uh, infrastructure. This is not human infrastructure, this is capital infrastructure. An interesting question coming in from Varun Pratap, who says, Ambassador, China has also made some important investments in Afghanistan, of course, that uh, copper mine in Mesa and Ark. Given their potential <coughs> to invest big, how does it affect India's interests in the long run? And we saw that uh, whole news uh, about the spiring in Afghanistan, which uh, India apparently helped bust. And uh, some reports suggesting that uh, there were strong words exchanged uh, or strong signals sent to Beijing about uh, their investments as well? Well, China, the, the copper mines was the only contract which was signed yeah. by China, which was, uh, uh, but there were no investments in it. It was just an MOU and that has not uh, produced anything. Uh, of course, that was the potential investment of $30 billion. It is like uh, what you talk here about the trillion dollars being spent on that board. Not everything gets really spent. Uh, you have to check what has happened perhaps even in CPEC. Uh, so that is a uh, hype. Uh, and the Chinese have a disadvantage there uh, that uh, they are so tied into the Pakistani policy that they are unable to have an independent policy towards Afghanistan. Until that happens, I don't think uh, it's going to affect because uh, uh, that's a big no for Afghans. Uh, and of course, in future, if there is peace and there is normal trade and investment, it shouldn't be welcome, I guess. We will have it's to compete. Uh, uh, welcome and it's not hype. And you had a, a lot to do, uh, do with is uh, Afghanistan in the IPL, the Afghan uh, cricketers in the IPL. We've seen all of them now. Uh, household uh, no, names. sir, absolutely. It just you proves the point uh, that... Kandahar and uh, I think a little bit in Mazar as well, the stadiums, right? I'm just going to take, before you answer the question, Tanoj Abbe Khanna who says, Afghans are a fun and friendly lot, mostly. I've had a great experience working with them on their cricket matches. They deserve peace. Go ahead, Ambassador. 
No, absolutely. The cricket is a classic example. Even football before that, you would have known that they had graduated. <laughs> they were so anyone. good. They were so good in South Asia that they graduated out of the South Asian group and they are now playing in Central Asian group. Uh, and the cricket also, uh, I think, basically it proves that uh, you can't really keep a good thing down for too long. And given an opportunity and peace, uh, they are excelling. And that is perhaps what Pakistan fears. And it wants a uh, weak government in Kabul so that uh, nothing happens. You know, it's still fixated with its own policy of uh, strategic depth, you can call it. I, of course, call it expansionism, uh, yeah. you know, trying to control resources. Water resources is important. Um, so, yeah, it's a mix of a lot of things. But uh, I agree with that sentiment. They are extremely friendly lot, but they're also very loyal lot. Uh, no one, uh... I think that's a perfect note to end when you said you can't uh, keep a good thing down. You're referring to cricket and using that as a metaphor for the country and for Afghanistan as well. Absolute pleasure again talking to you, even though it's across continents. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Once Thank you. Global Ambassador. Thanks. Always a pleasure, uh, Ravi. Bye. And just a reminder to all our subscribers that uh, you can uh, help finance uh, some of our journalism. If you would like to support us, just go onto our website, stratnewsglobal.com. You can also follow all our social media handles on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to get all the latest strategic news and analysis from an Indian perspective. This is Strat News Global. I'm Amit Abrevi.